We're delighted today to have as our guest Judge Griffin Bell, former advisor to governors, former chief of staff to Governor Vandiver, former Attorney General of the United States, former district federal judge. It's a great pleasure to have you, Judge Bell. Uh, thank you very much. What, what I would like to do, if you will, Judge Bell, so our audience will know you a little better, is just tell us a little bit about yourself growing up down in Sumter County. Well, I, I grew up in Sumter County, which is in uh, South Georgia, near Americas. I was born in, in what we could call the Concord community, which is about nine miles from Americas. And uh, my father was a cotton farmer and my grandfather was a cotton farmer. My grandfather's house is still standing there at Concord. I rode by there recently. They uh, both had to sell their farms during the uh, time of the Bold Way War. They, uh, they wiped out all the cotton farmers. They moved into Americas. I was in the attending school in a country school, and uh, I had skipped the grade. And so when I moved into Americas, I, I started into the fourth grade, but I'd been I skipped the third grade, so I was in the fourth grade, which was something of a disadvantage. I, I finally finished high school when I was 15, but uh, I grew up in a, I feel like I grew up in America, so although I was born on, on a farm. And I enjoyed the life of a small town, knew everybody in the town, greatly. My father's uh, first cousin was a, uh, a noted uh, lawyer and judge. He was on the Supreme Court of Georgia. And uh, my father always wanted me to be a lawyer, so he, he started talking to me when I was a little, little boy about being a lawyer. And he introduced me to lawyers, and uh, he used to take me by the courthouse during court week, let me listen to the arguments. And I think it was in my head to be a lawyer, and that's what I ended up being. But I've uh, had a very good life. I went to Georgia Southwestern. We were, didn't have very much money. And uh, that was all I could afford. It, it was a good junior college. And then I had to go into, uh, I had a low draft number. I was getting ready to go to law school at Mercer and uh, on a church scholarship. And uh, I got a low draft number, so I decided I'd serve one year in the military and then go to law school and of course the war started right after that and I four and a half years later before I got out of the army but I then did go to Western Law School. I was on the way to Athens to go to the University of Georgia and this is an old story and, and I decided I'd stop at Macon and ask the dean if he could get me a job part time at a law firm so I might speed up my career and the dean said if you'll uh, make good grades the first quarter, I'll guarantee you a job. And so I, I never got to Athens. I just decided I'd stay in Macon and get that job. And I was able to pass the bar examination that time. The fourth quarter I was in law school, I think. And one of the jokes we tell is that I became the city attorney at Warner Robins while I was still in law school. <laughs> but the reason I did, I, I lived in Warner Robins commuted into Macon, and it was nice, but I then uh, uh, was working part-time in this law firm in Macon, and I got a job in uh, with a law firm in Savannah, and was there for four years, and then our principal client was Central Georgia Railroad, and I got to know all about Georgia, everywhere the Central Georgia had a station we eventually I went to with some kind of a litigation. And then I went up to Rome, Georgia to represent the chairman of the board of the railroad when his, his, his own lawyer died and, uh, suddenly. And uh, then I was recruited by King and Spalding to come down here as a partner. And uh, I, was, I think I'd been practicing law six years then. And joined King and Spalding and I was in King and Spalding uh, for about nine years and uh, during that time I became the managing partner, we call it, of the law firm. 
succeeded Mr. Hughes Spalding. And, and uh, during that time, I managed the, uh, I was a co-chairman of the Kennedy campaign for president. And that's how I finally got into the federal judging business. I was a co-chairman along with George L. Smith, who was Speaker of the House. And then I, uh, Fred the Kennedy nominated me to be on the Fifth Second Court of Appeals, which covers six states, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida. And I kept that job for about 14 years. And, uh, Senator Russell was talented with the senators and they endorsed me, sponsored me, and I was able to get confirmed. And I left and came back to the law firm and was here about a 11 months and became Attorney General. The way I became Attorney General, Frederick Carter, I had known all my life, because I'm nine miles from Plains, and our families were friends. He asked me to find that someone to be Attorney General. And I spent a considerable time interviewing people to get somebody to be an Attorney General, and I never could find anybody that suited him. So people jokingly now claim that I did such a poor job that I got the job myself. <laughs> However, it may be, I did end up with the job, and that's how I became Attorney General. I had a uh, great experience on the bench. It was in the civil, during the Civil Rights Revolution, and it sort of became a uh, focus of my career, in a way. The whole civil rights era, I was Governor Vanderbilt's chief of staff, and, and we, he had promised uh, that there would be no integration of the schools. And after he was elected, but before he took office, the Supreme Court handed down the second, what we call the second Little Rock decision. And in that decision, they held that even the threat of violence was no excuse for not in integrating the schools. So it became clear to me and to most everyone else that Governor Vanderbilt couldn't carry out his pledge that there would be no integration. So the governor made, made me chief of staff, which is an honorary position, but <clears throat> I tell people it was like being a free lawyer. So he made me chairman of a committee of five people to advise him on what we should do about the Brown West Board of Education decision and carrying it out. And we went around and talked to uh, governors and attorney generals in other st states in the South. And uh, even in Virginia, where they had something that was it become quite famous called Massive Resistance. And uh, I had to report to the governor that no one had a plan to keep from following the law. It, Law is a law, and you have to follow it. And that became a big issue in, in Georgia politics. And uh, I was accused of being a great liberal by people that didn't want to have any integration at all, wanted to hold the line. And, but finally, uh, I told the governor that I thought we ought to let the people speak. And I wrote up a resolution at home on a Sunday night and uh, took it to the governor the next day and he didn't know if I was doing this and let him read it. And it was to have these hearings in the 10th congressional district and let the people decide if they wanted to keep the school, public schools open or did we want to go out of the school business, not put any state money in schools. You, you couldn't stop the local, uh, local support of schools, but this was state support. And we, uh, he, he thought well of it, but he said this, this won't work unless we have a very strong chairman. And he wanted to meet it to uh, find the chairman. I had it written on a way where every person on it would be either be appointed by the governor, or the speaker of the house, or the president of the senate, except some People that had public offices, like head of the Farm Bureau and different organizations. 
and he said, he, he, I said, who would you like to be the chairman? He said, I would like to have Mr. Hughes Spalding or John Sibley. John Sibley was, at that time, had left King and Spalding and had gone ahead and was head of the Sun Trust, the trust company bank. But his office was adjacent to the law firm office. So I went to see Mr. Spalding and he said he didn't want to do it because he was a member of the Catholic Church and people might think there was something wrong with him, a, a Catholic doing this job. And he said it'd be better for John Sibley to do it. And I said, well, I haven't been to see him yet. He said, well, let me talk to him before you go. So they, uh, then I talked to Mr. Sibley and Mr. Sibley said, is this, is this uh, Bony Fide, or is it some kind of a dodge somebody's thought of? I said, as far as I know, it's Bony Fide. I'm the one thought of it. So he said, well, I might do it, but the governor's got to ask me. He's got to come and I want to talk to him. I want to be sure I know what we're doing. So I got the governor to go to see him, and they, he agreed to be the chairperson, and that turned out to be a very good thing because he was a good chair. He's a good chairman. And they started these hearings, they had 10 of them, and one in each uh, congressional district. And Mr. Simpson said he wanted to have the first one in the place that would have that be the most resistance to integrating the schools. And they picked Americans, <laughs> my hometown. <laughs> and uh, they had, had one, one hearing in Gainesville, I've forgotten where all the hearings were, but they were well attended. And uh, people, voice their opinions and, and uh, then there, there were 21 people on the commission and they voted to keep the schools open even though they had to comply with the law and uh, there was a good many dissents uh, to the majority holding but that's the way it turned out and then based on that we decided that we had to repeal all the laws that had been passed just a few years earlier when they changed the flag and all those sorts of things. That those laws we couldn't, couldn't be complied with. So we had to have a session of the legislature, a special session to repeal those laws. So Governor Vanworth called a special session and he addressed the uh, General Assembly on television at night, which was the first time that had ever been done to explain the crisis and what we had to do. And we changed all those laws in a very, just a few days. And uh, left it up to each community to do what they wanted to do about the schools. And so we, Atlanta was the first one to have any integration. Finally, the whole, whole state complied. And, and I think we, uh, I think looking back on it, it was a very wise thing to do. We had to comply with the law. And there was no way around it. And we did it uh, about as well as we could have done it. And I think we got way ahead of some of our neighboring brothers and sisters because we did comply with the law. I think it turned out to be a good thing. I think it cost us any. Uh, his political career, uh, he knew that, but that, that was beside the point. And then when we had the University of Georgia crisis, it really brought it to a head because at that time he had the power to cut off all funding to the university. And that came up again, the very same thing, are we going to follow the law or not? And, uh, and it, they called this famous meeting, which you probably already know about. At the mansion, I was there and witnessed it, where he had all his top people, 21 of them, to tell them goodbye, assuming they all would resign in protest because he was going to announce he was not going to close the university. And uh, that he couldn't bring himself to do it. And they started down the line and told Mr. Gillis was the first one. He told Mr. Jim Gillis goodbye, thanked him for all he'd done for him. And he was going down the line and finally hit Frank Twitty, who was the majority leader in the House. And 
Twitter said, to, well, Governor, don't tell me goodbye. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay with you. And then the next one was Carl Sanders. He was a senator. He said the same thing. And the upshot was that not one of them helped. They all decided to stay. And that was before we repealed all the laws. And that whole thing just worked out. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch it. Uh, also very exciting and exhilarating to see people follow the law. That's one of the problems of the world, you know, there's so many places where the law is not followed. That's a redeeming feature, I think, probably of, the, of our country, that we are accustomed to following the law, even though it's hard, and even though we didn't agree with the Supreme Court decision. And it was something that Congress should have done rather than having the Supreme Court issue an edict. That's where most of the trouble started, and instead of the fifth, fifth section of the 14th Amendment provided it would be enforced by the Congress. And there never was. The Supreme Court did it. But still the law. And the supremacy clause in the uh, Constitution makes that clear. Every officer, state or federal, has to take the same oath. And uh, that means that the Supreme Court decisions, as well as the federal statutes, are the supreme law of the country. Now, while I was, uh, this brings me into the school desegregation cases. While I was a judge, I had this happen a lot of times. I had more school cases than any judges ever had. And most of them I was able to work out a compromise with the lawyers. I'd bring the lawyers in, talk with them, and sometimes the school superintendents, and they'd, they'd work out their own plans. And only in one or two instances did we have to do something different. I had to put the school board in Tolliver County in receivership, appoint the state school superintendent to run it because they were, the school superintendent was going to fire the court. And uh, it was sort of a test case that her lawyers wanted us to put her in jail as a woman. And, and I had no idea doing anything like that. And so I just said, well, we'll turn the school board people said to hold to a receiver. So I had to threaten that time or two, but if we did it once, nobody else wanted to be put in that shape. And uh, it worked out pretty well. We knew that in some of the districts where they had small student bodies, two, just two buildings or four buildings, that the schools would turn black. You could, uh, I had a chart I made over in Mississippi where we had 32, I had 32 school districts over where I was responsible for. And I made a chart just, just to see if, what the tipping point was before the whites would leave and start a private school. It was, it was around 30%, a little above 30 whites would start to leave. So you knew in advance you were getting ready to destroy some public school. But, the, but that was a cost of complying with the law. Everybody was losing something, and everybody was gaining something. So it was just the best way it happened to be. And I felt like an administrator. I was not a judge so much as I was an administrator. And I, but it was my duty to do that. So I did the best I could. And, and we had a lot of different kinds of civil rights cases. 3,000 cases, you heard. Yeah. Wrote 1,000 opinions. Yeah, that's right. And most of those were civil rights, weren't they? Well, a lot of them were. A lot of them, a lot of them were criminal cases, criminal maybe cases. corpus. Or just a, a mix of lots of civil rights cases. Involving a lot of things besides schools. I remember having a case in Mississippi where they had a, an appeal and in some little town, and I said, well, it, 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 let me get this straight now. What was the issue? These three, three judges sitting together, but we each one of us can ask questions. I said, what started all of this? They'd been parading, and they had an injunction against parading and whatnot. And see, well, the South had to get used to the First Amendment, that you have a right to assemble and petition the government for your grievances, which means you would, you'd march. And you're entitled to police protection when you march. Well, that's, that was a shocking thing to most people to know that was the law. 
and I asked these uh, lawyers, I said, what started all this uh, ruckus over there in this town in Mississippi? And they said, well, the, it was the blacks called it. They were marching. And uh, I said, well, why were they marching? And uh, he didn't give me a direct answer. And I asked the lawyer for the blacks what the march was about. I thought it was a school case or something like that. He said, we were marching to get some street lights and paving. And our part of town didn't have any street lights or paving. And the, the, where the whites lived, they had all the street lights and not paved roads. And that's all we were, that's all it was about. I said, I'll tell you what, we're, going, we're not going to hear any more in this case. Go home and get that settled among yourselves and, and, and be just act fairly. And you won't ever hear. I never heard any more about that case. It went away. <laughs> Little things like that would happen. That's why I felt like more of an administrator than a judge many times in those cases. But I learned a lot during that time, and after I was uh, in the government, after I left the Attorney General's office, during the Reagan administration, I was appointed to uh, the Commission on South Africa by Secretary Schultz, the State Department. And I was sent to Africa, to South Africa, to study the court system to see if they could eliminate apartheid through the court system. And I had to report back that they couldn't because they didn't have a constitution. There was nothing to it. There's no governing, governing law. The, uh, the parliament in South Africa could overrule any judge. And, uh, all, and the parliament had given all their powers to 10 people and the president. So they could just, and they, and they would be in order of stopping hearings in court, that sort of thing. So there was no way that, that would have worked out. That was, that was sad to have it be like that. But of course, by that time, all the whites wish they had a constitution. And they would have been better off, but they didn't have one. But I knew so much about the, the integration crisis because of my experience in this country. That's why they asked me to go over there and, and do that. But at any rate, my, I finally decided that uh, I was 56 years old and I didn't want to do the judging the rest of my life. The Civil Rights Revolution had essentially ended and we were overrun with uh, criminal cases like we are today. Where Every criminal is a free lawyer, and the lawyer, now with the state's even paying lawyers, and they've raised all these uh, points of every drug dealer wants to claim his, his rights are being violated in some way, and I don't want to hear any more of those cases, so I decided I'd rather be, go back and be a lawyer, and that's what I did, and that's how I, I came back to this law firm, and uh, I've been in this law firm three different times. So it's like having a home to go back to in a way, but I came back and then that's when I, Fred Court asked me to find an attorney general, and that's how I got started in the attorney general's job, which I like very much. It's really, people ask me, what's the best job you ever had? And I say, be an attorney general, because you, you could get something done. Uh, you didn't have to ask anybody. Uh, on the court, I had to get other judges to agree. But uh, there, you just tell people to do things and get them done. We did a lot of great things. You know, there's one thing I noticed uh, while you were Attorney General, that's been three decades ago. You concentrated on white collar crime. Yeah. Did you anticipate that type of activity that we've had the last few years? I did. You did? I did. I thought that was going to happen. There's so much opportunity for greed in the in the in the enterprise system, and uh, greed will take to destroy anything, and it'll destroy business if you're not careful. And we see it. We we see more of that now than we ever ever have before. And I just thought there's too much government money flowing for them not to help some kind of a problem here. They've taken over health care. 20% uh, of the national economy is spent on medicine now. Every, there's no hospital. There's hardly anything could operate without some government money coming in. Same way with farming. 
anything you can think of, the government funneling money in. So long as that goes in there, somebody's going to take part of it. And you, you know that's going to happen. And if it wasn't for the fact that you could be prosecuted, no telling how bad it'd be. So I foresaw that. And I knew that was going to happen. And I, the, uh, the other thing that I, I probably spent a lot of time on was making sure that the litigating capacity of the government is in one place in the Justice Department, not every little agency having lawyers and way to litigate. That's causing a lot of problems in Georgia now. Back at that time, all of the law enforcement was under the Attorney General. Now every little state agency has got their own lawyers. And uh, I don't know what the Attorney General even has control of most of them. That's a very bad thing. Even the colleges now have lawyers. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think all the law enforcement ought to be one place and you ought to know who's in charge so that you can hold that person responsible. And, I, and we used to have that in Georgia. But in the, in the federal government, it's enough fight every day to keep agencies from living there. They have to create more lawsuits, and, but the, the federal system, the Attorney General is the last one that has anything to do with litigation. They can't appeal a case without the Attorney General to read into it, things like that. And that was a very important to, to get the agencies to understand that and, and enforce it. And Mike Egan, you remember, remember yeah. Mike Egan, he was a Republican legislator. He was one of my assistants up there, one of the top people. And that was, that was his job to, to keep up with that, the litigating capacity of the Justice Department, settle disputes with agencies and whatnot. You and, also looked at, uh, at corruption in Congress. Oh, yeah. We had, that's right. Well, that was sort of forced on me that when I got there, it was a, they went a bad situation. There was a, a Korean named Thompson Park. It's supposed to have bribed a lot of congressmen. And there was an article in the New York Times that he had bribed over 200 members of the House. And Speaker O'Neill asked me to come over and address the House in, in a off the record session about what the truth was. And I did, and I, I looked at, got all the people to do something about it and studied it out. And I told him that that was a gross exaggeration, that there were some bribes, but that we didn't, uh, I thought there was less than 10. It turned out to be five. Now, at the New York Times said there's 200, over 200. Well, that would show we had the whole government was corrupt, but it wasn't like that. And uh, we got we got to the bottom of all that. And I finally, Thompson Paul left the country, and went to South Korea, and he wanted to come back, and and I agreed that that we might let him come back if he'd take a lot of take the test over there to be administered by the FBI. And I sent some FBI agents and, and a deputy attorney general over there to take his take his. Uh, deposition to find out what the truth was about how many congressmen he had brought. And the deputy attorney general called me on the scrambler phone from Seoul, Korea and said that we can't get the truth out of him, he's lying. And I said, well, just tell him he's lying and tell him he can't come back. And the whole deal's off. So he went back there and told him that and then he decided to tell the truth. <laughs> Anyway, that's where we got, that's where you got most of the information. We had him, uh, we, I'd already had him indicted, and uh, if he had left there, he, we were gonna pick him up in London or Paris, or flying back and arrest him anyway. But he wasn't come, he wouldn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, got all, we got it all straightened out. But that was a bad thing, and there were a few, few you know, if you got 400, 500 people in, Congress 535 found to be a few bad eggs. A few, there's a few bad ones in this building. Everywhere there's a few. Question is, I mean, the, the secret is to hold it down to a few. <laughs> that's, that's, what, you, that's what law is for. 
after your uh, service as Attorney General, you also participated in a lot of investigations yeah. for corruptions in corporations. I did, yeah. I actually made a practice out, out of it. So we have something in the law firm called what, you know, Special Matters. That's, that's corporate investigations and representing people in white collar crime situations with the, with the government. And uh, we represent a lot of people to get in trouble with the government about contracts and whatnot. And, we, and our policy is that if, if, we, if we think they're guilty, we tell them so. And we settle with the government, pay the government back, it's tax money. And it works out pretty well. It's become a big business. But I did a lot of corporate investigations. I did the Exxon Valdez grounding investigation, for example. A lot of times you need to just know what happened. And it's so much, so much speculation. So it's in the interest of uh, companies to sometimes just bring an outsider and find out for sure what happened. So I've, I've, I've done a lot of that. I've had a very, very interesting career. And, I've been retired now three years, and uh, it it's, it's sort of difficult to get out of the mainstream, but I've gotten used to not being in it, and uh, I'm, I'm sort of enjoying life, but I still keep office and secretary, so I, I know what's going on, but I don't do much myself. But well, your secretary just reminded us that you have a doctor's appointment. I do, yeah. But let, let me end this, got a, Judge Bell. I got 15 more minutes. Oh, you do? Well, yeah. good. Well, let's go right on. Let's go on. Yeah. No, well, that's a, that's a, you asked me some questions now. I'm, I'm giving you sort of a general run. Well, I would like to ask you a question about uh, your relationship with President Carter while you were in Washington. Well, it was very good. President Carter and I don't see eye to eye on politics much now. But then he was a very good person to wait for. He had the right idea about the Justice Department. He told me in advance that he didn't think there ought to be any politics at all in the Justice Department. That he considered it to be a neutral, a place that ought to be neutral. We, we, got, we started calling it a neutral zone in the government. If you think about it, the law has to operate on neutral principles. And if it doesn't, then there's some outsized forces that are having an effect which would not be proper. And so with that in mind, I never had to go to a political meeting of any kind. I was never asked to do anything that had anything to do with politics. And two or three times uh, somebody at the White House would, would try to influence somebody and I'd put a stop to it immediately. One, one time I, I actually got up some somebody fired before the Justice Department who tried to don't see it in a criminal case. And uh, at, at that time, President Carter asked me to come over and speak to the White House staff about not ever trying to interfere with the Justice Department. And then he asked me to make one to tell them they couldn't interfere with the Defense Department. <laughs> <laughs> the same way. So he had the right idea about the government. He's very sound on, uh, on, on how the government ought to operate. Very ethical. And it was a pleasure to work with him. When he was governor of Georgia, he was sort of a hands-on manager. Yeah. It sounds like that he left you to, to run the Justice he Department. He did. And I, I always thought it was because he wasn't a lawyer. <laughs> you know, even they said Lester Maddox didn't try to run the judiciary. <laughs> He'd get people to do it. But President Carter let me run it, and I, it was good. And I think that's the way the Justice Department has to be run. I was talking to some people this morning about the Justice Department, and we, we were making the point of the, the people that I was talking to had both at one time been in the Justice Department. It runs well when there's not a politician running it. <laughs> get a lawyer. Just get a good lawyer and put him in there. Somebody that understands the federal system. I can't just take somebody like, we we'll say, Ms. Reno, who was a state prosecutor in Miami. They won't have a broad enough knowledge to to do the job well to begin with. I, I don't mean to criticize her, but she'd be an example of somebody who wasn't trained. You know, I was trained in the federal judiciary, so that made it easy for me. But if 
you just take some politician and put him in there, you, you, you ask it for trouble. That, we shouldn't have that. And, and the Justice Department, Elgin Floors, depending on who the Attorney General is, of course it reflects the Attorney General. Although the people there are career workers, and they are, well, I like to compare them to the British civil servants, it doesn't matter who the people elect. You've got this staff, it's really professional. <coughs> and the Justice Department got walls of people like that. All the lawyers are coming in on the honor system, which means they have to be in top 10% of the classes. And they, they like it, and most of them will just stay there. Thought of, you didn't think they'd come stay two or three years, or they'd sign up for four years to get in the program. But this, this lots of them have been there 15, 20 years, and that makes it a good place. But you still have to have a leader and the top people, the president gets about, at that time, got about 70 appointments at Justice Department out of 55,000. So, and the rest of them are in place. But they are, they are really the policy makers, the new people. I remember one time I had to replace the head of the uh, antitrust division who didn't want to leave. He said that he wasn't interfering with President Carter's program. He said, I'm running my own uh, program. I said, that's the reason you have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been elected, you're running your own program. <laughs> I said, we have elections in this country, you know. <laughs> you also paid special attention to intelligence. Oh, yeah. Attorney General. Well, I knew a little bit about intelligence from some court cases, but not much. And I had to study all of that. I, I, I became sort of a semi-expert in the, in the field. I mean, I understand the constitutional power of the president. And I'm the one that got the law passed to setting up the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that we use now. And um, I didn't think of that. Attorney General Levy, who was Attorney General on the Ford, thought of that, and his man, he had been president of the University of Chicago, and he got to Washington right after Watergate, and the Senate and the House committees, church committee and somebody, some committee in the House, had about destroyed the foreign intelligence capacity with the investigations, and he set out to rebuild it. And he finally, and the Attorney General in the system, the you know, agent of the president, approves all these foreign intelligence operations like what's happening and those sorts of things. And and General Levy decided that we had to have the imprimatur of the federal courts in some way for the public to have confidence in the system. And he got a bill introduced in the Congress which was not passed to set up that Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. He recommended it to me. I got it passed. And uh, I testified though in the House that that did not take away the president's power. If the president didn't want to follow that, he wouldn't have to follow it. Because the president's executive power gives the president the right to operate foreign intelligence like he operates foreign policy. And his authority for that was John Marshall, who, as you know, was a lieutenant under George Washington. And then Washington set the government up. And John Marshall, when he was a Secretary of State under John Adams, testified in the House as to the, the duty and power of the executive. And one of them, he said, what well, power was to operate the foreign intelligence, which he said has to be done in secret. Because it, and so the Supreme Court of the United States in 1936, in an opinion, Quoted that and upheld it, is saying that is a law. It is a law now, and these, despite what all the congressmen argue about, and every, all the pundits have to say, that is the law. President Carter agreed to use the Foreign Intelligence Court, and then the president since then have agreed to it, but it got so cumbersome, given the fact of Al Qaeda where they're making these phone calls, you couldn't go into the Justice Department 
have an investigation and get an order from the Attorney General and then the court to listen on the phone. It would be over with. <laughs> so President Carter, President of Bush then decided the thing to do after 9-11 was to go ahead and on his own order have them listen to these calls that was coming if it were coming from Al Qaeda source into this country. That's what they were doing. And that case is in court now in the Secret Circuit. And I I anticipate they're going to reverse that, that, that district court judge in Detroit. If not the Supreme Court's going to reverse them. The Supreme Court knows this law just as well as I know what it is. So but the but the president in the meanwhile is now got to met with the, uh, had somebody meet with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, who were just federal judges appointed on special duty. And one of the first of the seven, I was, I mean, I, I worked with the Chief Justice to set up the court. One of the first was Bill O'Kelly. Yeah. yeah, he saved as one of the judges. And what you do is have a, a judge on duty 30 days, and then another one 30 days, and they sign off on these things. It's not like getting a warrant. They sign a, an approval of something the Attorney General already approved. And and so they, uh, they've they had a meeting, obviously. I, I, don't, I don't know this, but I've got this bulletin from the Attorney General explaining it. That uh, from now on, except that the uh, Foreign Intelligence Court has set up some kind of expedited way where you do it fast enough. It got away of it, just took too long. And they turned down, you know, a, a requ FBI request to look at a computer, uh, at the server on a computer that one of these Al Qaeda types had that actually went, I think, was one of the ones that got on the airplane, flew up the plane. They turned that down because they didn't have enough information at the Justice Department, and that was one of the big things when they had the 9-11 hearing. They were complaining about uh, uh, one of the members of the commission was uh, Jamie Gorelick, who was deputy to Ms. Reno, and they blamed her for turning it down. That was one of the big things that was going on, but they never, it's all so secret they wouldn't, you couldn't tell from the newspaper what it was about. But that was. And it was about that time that the president decided that he had to get signed these orders to, so we could listen to those calls. And the general public, I'm sure, does not object to listen to well, us over, overhearing a call from somebody in the Al Qaeda organization. But they all wonder how you, they don't want the president to do that. You know, they think, well, the president got too much power. Well, that's, that's his job under the Constitution unless we don't agree with George Washington and John Marshall and John Adams. <laughs> we got subject, another crowd we're listening to. On the subject of, uh, of justice, what rights do these foreign uh, foreigners who come into this country to commit uh, those acts have under our Constitution? Well, it, that's a, people can't understand why they have any rights. You know, illegal, illegal aliens even claim rights. Uh, but I guess we, of course, we're so civilized, we we give them some of the rights. But they don't have all every right that a citizen has. But they have some rights to due process, for example. They will not hold people without having a basis for holding them. Even the prisoners at Guantanamo. I'm on the review panel for the those cases, if they ever had one to review, they haven't tried one yet, but they are, uh, they, they have a, you got to be saying you're not holding the wrong person. Uh, it could be a mistake. So they have in the military hearings to be sure they got the right, but that's why they release some of them. And the others they were released, but the country won't take them back they came from. They don't want them. Australia, there's one Australian down there, you know, and, and the Prime Minister of Australia said, we'd be glad to take him back after y'all finished trying him. <laughs> they figured they'll never get him back. <laughs> but these are not the most desirable people. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Well, I want to share with our audience uh, this question.
quote about our guest today, Judge Bell, who I have admired personally over the years for all the great service he's rendered to the state of Georgia. But this is from Chief Justice Warren Burger, who said, No finer man has ever occupied the office of Attorney General of the United States or discharged his duty with greater distinction than Griffin Bell. I sit here in awe of you, sir. All right. All right. Thank you very much. That shows what a good friend Chief Justice Burger was. <laughs> okay.